Hey, STAT students, how you doing? Time for another video. This, was, this one is going to be over inference of the difference of two proportions, okay? So uh, by what I mean by the difference of two proportions, let's just jump right into an example, okay? Uh, in the summer of 2003, the New England Journal of Medicine published results of Scandinavian research into the use of surgery to treat patients suffering from prostate cancer. Men diagnosed with prostate cancer were randomly assigned to either undergo surgery or not. Among the 347 who had surgery, 16 eventually died of prostate cancer. And among the 348 that did not, 31 died of prostate cancer. Okay. So my first reaction to this is, oh my God, they could actually do an experiment? If I've got prostate cancer or not, I mean, if, I, if I have prostate cancer and I'm trying to decide whether I have surgery or not, I would really want to be the one to, to make that decision, not some random assignment, but hey, uh, good for science, right? Uh, so, uh, so let's see. Uh, we had, uh, this, this is an experiment. We, we randomly assigned people to either the treatment group, that is surgery, or the non-treatment group, that is no surgery. And so what we're wondering now is, uh, is this evidence? that surgery is actually effective in preventing death from prostate cancer. Okay, so um, let's, let's draw this out a little bit, okay? We have 695 total men, okay? And they get randomly assigned to either the surgery group or the no surgery group. And in the surgery group, 16 out of the 347 died. In the no surgery group, 31 out of 348 died, giving us two different P hats, okay? So this is uh, our sample proportion for the surgery group, uh, 0.0461, and our sample proportion for the uh, uh, no surgery group is 8.91% uh, or 0.0891. Um, okay, so now this is where the two proportions come into play, okay? What we see is two different p-hats. Those two different p-hats are estimates of two different p's. That is to say, uh, uh, there is a probability of death from prostate cancer if you have surgery, okay? There is that probability, there is that number. We don't know what it is, but there is that P, that probability, okay? Uh, or you can think of it as a proportion, the proportion of those who have cancer that die, uh, that, that have cancer and have surgery that die as a result of prostate cancer. And over here, this is, there is a P, P sub N, uh, that is the proportion of those who die from prostate cancer who do not have surgery, okay? Out of all the people in the world, okay? And so here's our P, uh, our P hat in, which is an estimate of that proportion, okay? We got 348 people there, and we looked at how many died, and so there's, an, there's our estimate there. So uh, now, if I want to know if this is evidence that surgery is effective in preventing death from prostate cancer, uh... Well, first off, whenever you see evidence that, that means that's our alternative hypothesis, okay? So let's come up with our hypotheses here. Uh, the alternative is going to be surgery is effective in preventing death from prostate cancer. In other words, the probability that you die from prostate cancer after surgery is going to be less than the probability that you die from prostate cancer not having surgery. So P sub S is less than P sub N, okay? And so therefore, your null hypothesis has to be, of course, P sub S equals P sub N, okay? All right, so we got our hypotheses down. And uh, so, uh, oh, and now, of course, we have to define what our, what our different P's are here. Uh, P sub S is the probability of death from prostate cancer after surgery. P sub N is the probability of death from prostate cancer with no surgery, okay? Now, there's another way of writing this. We can say P sub S equals P sub N, or another way of saying that is that P sub S minus P sub N equals zero. And another way of saying P sub S is less than P sub N is to say that P sub S minus P sub N is less than zero. Why do we do it this way? There's a really good reason. It's very hard to set up a model where one probability is equal to another probability, okay? But if you think about it, our p hats, our p hats are going to be normally distributed random variables with a mean about each of the p's. Okay. Well, if we, if you remember, if you add two normally distributed random variables, 
you get a normally distributed random variable. And if you subtract two normally distributed random variables, you get a normally distributed random variable. So what that means is I can think of p, uh, p hat s minus p hat n as being a normally distributed random variable, and it's going to be uh, uh, centered right around that, which our null hypothesis says is zero. So now, now we're rocking and rolling. Now we're, we're on our way, OK? So there we go. Here's, uh, here's the distribution of p hat s. It's normally distributed around p s. There's our standard deviation. Uh, there's the, uh, the distribution of p uh, hat n. It's uh, normally distributed around p n. With, uh, with that standard deviation. So if we subtract them, what we get is a normally distributed random variable. And if you remember, the difference of the, the mean of the difference of random variables is the difference of the means. So that means the, uh, the expected value here would just be PS minus P sub N. The standard deviation, however, think back to uh, prior chapters, okay? When you subtract random variables to calculate the standard deviation, you don't calculate the standard deviation, you calculate the variance, okay? And when you subtract random variables, you still add the variances, okay? So just take away the radical sign there and you would get our variances. Add those up together, and there's the variance of the new random variable. Now take the square root, and there's the standard deviation of our new random variable, okay? So it's gonna be the square root of PSQS over NS plus PNQ over NN, okay? two different samples, and we have to look at the, the P, the Q, and the N for each of those, okay? Now, remember, the null hypothesis says that PS and PN are the same thing. So if that's the case, well, we're just gonna call it P, okay? There, there's no need for any subscripts here. We'll just call it P, and so all these places where you see a PS or a PN, we'll just take that out and we'll call it P, okay? Well, P minus P, I think we can all agree that that is zero, okay? And uh, here we have the square root of PQ over NS. NS and NN still exist because those are the sample sizes of our surgery sample and our non-surgery sample. So those still do exist, okay? So uh, uh, here um, we have uh, PQ over NS plus PQ over NN, and we can factor out a PQ there and we can say, this is a, a randomly, a, 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 a random variable that follows a normal model, the mean of which is zero, and the standard deviation of which is the square root of PQ times uh, the, the reciprocal of both of those sample sizes, okay? That was kind of fast, but you know, hit the pause button if you need to, all right? So, let's get back over here again. Let's see what we, uh, uh, let's see what we can say now. We know that we have this random variable, PS minus PN that has this distribution. These are the observations that we got. And so, uh, ah, this, you may have noticed. Okay, well look, I know it follows this particular, uh, uh, this, this particular distribution, but even though the null hypothesis says that PS and PN are the same thing, it doesn't tell us what that thing is, okay? It doesn't tell us, oh, and the probability of death is ha la la la. No, we, we, we don't get that. So what do we do? We have to estimate it, okay? So that's why I have here a P hat and a Q hat. That's the only difference from this line to this line. Uh, well, th from this to this, okay? All right, so we have to calculate a standard error of P hat S minus P hat N. Um, now, how do we get this P hat and this Q hat? It's pretty easy, actually. It's called pooling, okay? The best, the best estimate of the probability of death, if we assume that surgery have, makes no difference, is to take everybody and throw them in the same group. Because if surgery makes no difference, according to the null hypothesis, then it shouldn't matter if they're in different groups, okay? So that means instead of looking at 16 out of 347 or 31 out of 348, what we're gonna look at is the total 47 out of 695, and that's gonna be our P hat. It's a pooled P hat, okay? And so, there we go. It gets us 47 over 695, which is about 6.76%. And so now we come up with a standard error that is all this stuff, and uh, comes out to about 2%, okay? 1.9%. And so now we have here 
that p hat s minus p hat n, okay, you do this experiment. You get one sample proportion, you get another sample proportion, you take the difference of those sample proportions. The difference is going to be normally distributed, it should, it should be right around zero, the mean is going to be zero, and the standard deviation is going to be 0.019, okay? So, okay, cool, we can come up with a z-score then. This is our test statistic here, our z-score of, uh, of uh, our, 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 the difference of our p-hats. And so that's going to give us 0.0461 minus 0.091 over our standard deviation, and that gets us a z-score of negative 2.263. And you should already be thinking, ooh, that's pretty low, okay? That's more than two standard deviations below the mean. That's not likely to happen. The probability of a z-score being that low is only 1.2%, okay? And if that's the case, then I think I can successfully reject this null hypothesis and make my conclusion, which is to say, because there's only a 1.2% chance of getting a difference of sample proportions that's high, assuming the null hypothesis, I <coughs> reject the null hypothesis, okay? And I say there is statistical evidence that the probability of death from prostate cancer is less for those who have surgery than for those who do not, okay? We do have statistical evidence. All right, so uh, we good there? I hope so. Um, <clears throat> now, we just breezed right over our conditions. Let's unbreeze. Let's get back and make sure that the game we just played, that we could actually play it. Okay, now if you remember, for, uh, uh, for one proportion uh, uh, hypothesis tests, uh, we had these three conditions, right? Well, for two proportion hypothesis tests, we also have these three conditions, okay? There's random randomization. Now for this, we didn't random, we didn't go out and randomly select people and say, bam, you have prostate cancer now. No, you don't get to do that, okay? You take the volunteers, but then we randomly assigned. So it can be random selection or random assignment. And random assignment is just as good, okay? Uh, the, as far as independence goes, uh, remember the 10% rule, okay? Your sample size has to be less than 10% of the entire population. Well, in this case, the sample size we're talking about is this up here, this 695. It's the total, it's the combination of the two samples. That has to be less than 10% of your population. And in addition to that, you must have independence of groups. The random assignment takes care of the independence of groups. If we had, if this were like a matched pairs design, or if people could decide which group they're going to be in, your groups are no longer independent. That they're, they're, they have a relationship with one another, and uh, all bets are off at that point. Okay? And then, do we have a big enough sample to use a normal model? Okay, think about it for a second. The difference of p hats is normally distributed. Why? Because those p hats are each normally distributed. In order for those p hats to each be normally distributed, we have to have a lot of pns and pq and nqs. Uh, uh, be at least 10. So basically, you have to do, you have to check four numbers, okay? You have to check this P, P hat S times NS, uh, and, and uh, uh, see what you get. And basically what you get is 16, okay? You, the NSs cancel out. Um, in the end, basically what you have to do is you have to make sure, do I have at least 10 observed successes and failures in each group, okay? Uh, you, you could make an argument that you'd, you would want to use the, uh, the pooled p-hat instead of the, uh, in the, uh, these p-hats. But the fact is, if these are both at least 10, your pooled p-hat is also going to be at least 10, so you're good to go. Okay? So make sure you have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures uh, in each of your groups, and, uh, and that's, that's sufficient to use the normal model here. Okay? Now, uh, what about confidence intervals? Well, let's talk about that, okay? Uh, <clears throat> use the exact same conditions, so the conditions we use for hypothesis testing, exact same ones for confidence intervals. Um, so we, we, get the, we have the same experiment that we did, right? Okay, and, uh, and so your confidence interval is gonna be, we set it up exactly like we set up the one proportion confidence intervals. You take your, your statistic, your, your, uh, your observation, plus or minus, uh, your um, significance, your your uh, um, your z star, okay, uh, which which is completely dependent upon your confidence level, okay, uh, and times the standard error of your your random variable, okay, okay, and uh, so no pooling this time, okay, 
You do not pool your peas to get one pea hat. Why not, you ask? Because this time we're not assuming that they're the same thing. Okay? Before, with the null hypothesis, we said PS, PN, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter. You can just pool them together. Not the case this time. Okay? So this time what you do is you keep that, uh, uh, that standard error. You keep these basically separate. Okay? So it's going to be your observation, the, 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 the difference in your observed p hats, plus or minus the critical value times uh, your standard error. And the standard error is simply the square root of pq over n over uh, plus pq over n, okay, from the two groups. And I said pq, I meant p hat q hat, okay? Uh, so what would it be here? Well, <clears throat> just plug them on in, and we would get. Uh, we would get 0.043, uh, that's uh, the difference in our, uh, our, our observed p hats, plus or minus z star times, once you crunch all these numbers you get 0.019, very similar to what we saw last time, and uh, so for a 95% confidence interval, z star would of course be 1.96, and uh, we would get this, also known as uh, a margin of error of 3.7%, so that means we would say that surgery improves your chances of survival by somewhere between 8% and 0.6%. Kind of a wide uh, uh, margin of error there. Uh, that's, that is simply the nature of two proportion uh, confidence intervals, that you do get a fairly wide margin. Because remember, when you, even though you're subtracting two random variables, you have to add the variances, and so the standard devi deviation gets bigger. Okay? All right. Uh, so that's what we would say. I'm 95% confident that the probability of death due to prostate cancer is between 0.6% and 8%, uh, less for men who have surgery than for those who do not. And uh, remember, 95% confident means that if we did this procedure over and over, not our particular numbers, but the procedure, if we did this, this experiment over and over and over and over and over, each time coming up with a confidence interval for the difference, that 95% of the time, our interval would contain the true proportion, which does exist, we just don't know what it is, okay? Now, uh, let's uh, just, just look real fast at the difference between the one proportion Z intervals and tests and the two proportion Z intervals and tests, okay? Your conditions you see are extremely similar. Uh, the, the, it's just that the conditions for the two proportion uh, tests and intervals are, are slightly more. Uh, and uh, as far as the hypothesis goes, with a one proportion, you say P equals something for your null hypothesis, okay? For your two proportion one, you, what you say is my proportions equal each other, okay? P1 equals P2. And then for the alternative hypothesis, it must still be stated as an inequality, just like with the first ones, okay? You still can do a two-tailed test if you want to, or a one-tailed test. Um, and then your test statistic, that is to say the z-score of your observation, we refer to that as the test statistic. Uh, the first time it was p hat minus uh, uh, my, my assumed value of, uh, of p divided by the standard deviation of, uh, um, of p hat. And in my second one, I take the difference of my p hats and I divide it by the standard error of my, uh, of my p hat, okay? Um, the standard error of my difference of p hats. And then finally, the confidence intervals. Uh, really, the, the main difference here is just how involved that is. Uh, you see, it's, uh, uh, you take this variance, and you add them together, and then take the square root to get the standard deviation. It's, it's, you know this stuff. You got this, OK? OK, let's talk about errors for a second, OK? Let's talk about ways that we can make boo-boos. There's two ways that we can make errors doing hypothesis tests, OK? And uh, statisticians in all of our creative glory, we've called those type one and type two, okay? Uh, the type one error is your null hypothesis is actually true, but you mistakenly reject it, okay? The type two error is your null hypothesis is false. Your alternative hypothesis is true, but you weren't able to, to reject the null hypothesis, okay? Uh, well, let's look at the probability of the first one happening. The probability of the first one happening, let's think about this. The null hypothesis is true, and you accidentally rejected it. How'd that happen? Well, it happened because you got a weird sample. 
Okay? You've got a strange set of data there, or you, a strange sample of data there, and uh, what's the likelihood of that happening? Well, remember, you reject your null hypothesis if your p-value is less than alpha. And uh, so basically it's going to be all the samples that give you a p-value that's less than alpha. And how, uh, how many of those are there going to be? Well, alpha. That's exactly what it is. The probability of mistakenly rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually true is exactly alpha. Okay, we talked about that in the past. What is alpha? It's your tolerance for being wrong. Okay, in particular, it's your tolerance for being wrong when the null hypothesis is true. Okay? Now, how do you calculate alpha? You don't. You select it. You decide. Okay? So, uh, that's pretty easy. Type 2 error is a little more involved. Okay? Uh, the probability of a, this should say type 2, I'm sorry. The probability of a type 2 error is the probability of failing to reject the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. And we give that the name beta. Okay? Second letter of the, uh, the Greek alphabet. And again, you can see that statisticians are just wildly creative with the nomenclature. Um, and then there's one more term that I want you to know, and that is the power of a test. The power of a test is simply 1 minus beta. That is, it's the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when you should. Okay? So if, if a test is very powerful, that means if the null hypothesis really is wrong, you're probably going to reject it. Okay? Now, let's look at how one would calculate a type 2 error, the, how one would calculate uh, the beta, the, uh, the probability of, uh, uh, of uh, getting a type 2 error. So let's say this is our null hypothesis, okay? Uh, that, uh, uh, that P is centered around here, and so this is going to be the distribution of P hat, and we say, here is, I, I set my alpha so that if I get a, any kind of a, a, a weird data set that's over here, a weird sample that's over here, I'm going to reject my, uh, my null hypothesis. And let's say that this is actually where P is, okay? I should reject my null hypothesis because the null hypothesis is not true. The alternative hypothesis is true. This is actually where, uh, where, where this is where P is, and so this is going to be the distribution of P hat. Well, what that means is that this is actually the probability of getting data this weird. So actually, the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis here would be slightly more than 50%, because you can see it's slightly more than half of the area under that curve. And this right here would be beta. So the red area is the power of my test. The yellow area is beta. Now, you might be saying, yeah, but that's just for that particular value of p. What if p was over there? Oh, well, then. Uh, then you have a much more powerful test if that's the case, and beta is just this little bitty thing right here. Yeah, but what if P is actually over here? Oh, shoot. Okay, well, if that's the case, then, uh, then there's my power. It's not a very powerful test, uh, and uh, the probability of making a type 2 error is actually quite great there. Um, the good news for you, you are not required to calculate beta. Okay, that's really, calculating beta requires uh, it requires calculus, it requires some math that's really beyond the scope of this course. So don't worry about calculating beta, but do know that there is this beta, this, uh, the, this uh, probability of making a type 2 error, and this idea of power of the test, which is simply 1 minus beta. Okay? Now, how do you influence power? How do you, how do you change it? You only have control over two things. Okay? You can raise your alpha. If you raise your alpha, that means you raise the probability of making a type 1 error. The probability of making a type 2 error goes down, and the power of your test goes up. But what if I don't want to raise alpha? Okay, I don't want to raise the probability of making that kind of mistake. Well, you could always lower alpha, but that means the probability of making a type 2 error is going to go up. So you kind of can't win here, okay? If you make one, if you make the probability of one type of uh, error go up, the other, the probability of the other type of error is going to go down, and vice versa. Okay, and remember, power is always just one minus beta. So if beta goes up, power goes down. The only thing you can do to make both of them, to keep both of them low, is make your sample size go up. Okay, if the sample size go up, goes up, then the probability of making a type two error is going to go down, and the power is going to go up. This is all you have control over either your sample size or your alpha. So the general recommendation is if, uh, if, if your alpha and your beta are too high, 
go get more data. Okay? All right, that's it. Next video is over the inference of means. We've talked a lot about population proportions and uh, the difference of proportions. Now we're going to talk about sample means and population means. See you then. Thank you.